Hello and welcome everyone to the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce's online panel webinar on the future of green development and ecological urban planning within the Commonwealth. For our Commonwealth Chamber community members joining us again for another webinar, welcome back, it's lovely to see you. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, could I also extend a warm welcome to you all. The Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce was set up here in Hong Kong last year and with such deep roots and long history of a diverse Commonwealth community, it provides a platform and information hub for Commonwealth businesses in Hong Kong and for entrepreneurs and individuals to network, support and help each other with the growth of their Commonwealth businesses. We hope to foster constructive debate across a range of business areas um, within the Hong Kong SAR and across the Commonwealth. And we're also serving as a platform for this diverse pool of business people with respect for others' point of views. Of course, today our discourse will centre around the heightened need for ecological sustainability amidst the backdrop of climate change that has the growing potential of throwing the world we know it into chaos unless we all do our part to better our lifestyle and habits to create a green and sustainable ecosystem that will allow our environment to return to some kind of equilibrium. Considering the enormity of this topic, we are absolutely delighted to have a panel of very talented and experienced experts in the urban planning and infrastructure fields to share with us their thoughts on their hard work and efforts in creating green living environments. So could I please now ask Andrew Wells, the General Secretary of the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce, to introduce our wonderful speakers for today for our webinar, which is going to last for 90 minutes. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, Julia, and um, thank you to all our distinguished speakers and participants. Good evening or good morning, as the case may be. As Secretary General, I would like to echo the welcome extended just now by Julia to our panel and to welcome you all to yet another Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong event. The interrelated subjects of green development and eco-urban planning are, of course, of critical importance to all global citizens, but perhaps nowhere more so than in the vast network of Commonwealth countries and territories in greater China and in our own beloved city of Hong Kong. So all of your participation could not be more timely or more welcome, and I thank you sincerely for it. Let me now briefly introduce our three speakers in order of virtual appearance. First, Dr. Mina Samangoi. Mina is a respected academic and senior lecturer in architecture and technology at the renowned Oxford Brookes University. She also, which is a rare combination, has experience as a professional businesswoman with an extensive range of experience in residential, commercial, and public development projects. This is an area in which I happen to have spent most of my own professional career. As a designer, she's well known for inspiring and working with community groups to create projects that, as I understand, will resist the challenges of time. She's particularly she has particular expertise in energy efficient design and the role that food production in and on buildings can play in our urban future, a subject which, as Julia knows, um, is of particular interest to our young Commonwealth entrepreneurs. Second, Dr. Mike Wells, founding director and owner of Biodiversity by Design. Full disclosure required, we are related, and Mike has played a very constructive role during the first year of the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce Hong Kong operation. He's the first ecologist in the UK to have been made a royal designer for industry for his achievements in ecological design, and has worked globally in the design of urban areas, whether it's new cities or urban regeneration. He was the ecological designer, for example, of the London Athletes Village for the 2012 Olympic Games, the design ecologist for Ken Yang's award-winning Suasana Office Project to Malaysia, 
and the project ecologists to Tata's first biophilic resort in India, which has the lovely name of Mist, which you should Google if you don't know about it. Mike has also undertaken consultancies in eco-urbanism in Hong Kong and has published widely on the design aspects of urban ecology. Third, we are honoured to welcome Gary Grant, Director of Green Infrastructure Consultancy. Gary, an old friend, has, I think, four decades of experience in urban ecology and urban greening. He advises people in different industries on how to incorporate ecology into planning and design by writing strategies, design briefs, all that hard work, and working with design teams. He helped to devise the urban greening factor for London, the London plan, and has worked on infrastructure strategies, green infrastructure strategies from Wales to Cambodia. He's a recognized expert on green roofs, walls, and rain gardens. I believe he'll share with us today some of his recent experiences with the Victoria Business Improvement District and the quite extraordinary uh, Rubens at the Palace Hotel. Please uh, let me now add a few brief words about this evening's format. Uh, each speaker will be invited to make a 15-minute presentation. We'll then go to what I'm sure will be a thought-provoking question and answer session. Um, you're encouraged to put questions to the speakers at any time using the appropriate Q&A icon. When you do so, please also identify yourself if you wish to and the speakers that you wish to respond to you. With those brief words, uh, thank you again. And may I now invite Mina to take the virtual floor. Hello, everyone. I just get my full screen ready. So, um, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm going to speak to you about why green design makes economic sense from an architect's point of view. I'm an architect in the UK and a senior lecturer teaching architecture at Oxford Brookes University. So this is um, an image our students see a lot. Um, when I teach them. This is the UN Sustainable Development Goals and um, it's a holistic framework for sustainability. So when we talk about things being sustainable, um, a, a architecture being sustainable, a project, a product being sustainable, we use this framework to see all the areas that we need to look at. And you can see there's life on land and life below water in there which is part of green infrastructure that we're going to talk about. So this is the framework that is um, what we mean by sustainability when we say sustainability. There's, um, there's an issue with the climate and there's an issue with biodiversity. The architects have, um, have uh, agreed and uh, are, are looking to address uh, for the over 30 years, but even more so these days, it's on top of the agenda for architects and built environment professionals. What architects try to do is address the spirit of place. So when we design, we, we look at the genius loci, the, sp the spirit of place, and, and, when, um, um, and we design um, buildings that fit onto a site, um, that work well for the community around them. Um, we visualize the genius loci, the spirit of place for, for um, humans to live in. But what we need, what we increasingly need to do is try and understand how our visions that we create are having an impact on the climate and on the local ecology, as well as the impact on the occupants. Um, and there's a standard called Passive House Standard that we're using a lot in the UK um, and in Europe, uh, where we look at adding um, increasing the insulation and thermal mass if you're in a hot and humid climate, um, looking at um, energy efficient windows to reduce that heat loss, looking at thermal bridging um, and MVHI ventilation units, whole, 
whole building ventilation units that you all must be very familiar with, whether it's air conditioning or heat recovery. So the passive house standard helps reduce the uh, reduce the energy consumption of buildings, which of course addresses the climate emergency. Um, and these types of buildings are winning prestigious awards. This is a Sterling Prize winner, um, a passive house standard housing in, in the UK, in, in Norwich. Um, so it's more and more on top of the agenda to increase energy efficiency of our buildings. And not only the energy efficiency, the reducing the operational carbon, but also reducing the embodied carbon. So the materials that we use to build these buildings, these visions and uh, places, spirit of place that we're trying to create. We're also looking at reducing the embodied carbon of, of how we build them, where these materials come from and um, and not only the embodied carbon, but the embodied ecological impact as well of these materials. So we're on a trajectory to make sure this is reduced. And then also this saves us money. So the energy costs of these buildings greatly reduce when we increase the energy efficiency me measures using passive house principles, using passive design strategies, which of course come from vernacular, vernacular architecture as well. And what we need to be aware of is this carbon tunnel vision that we uh, are, are, are getting perhaps too focused on. Um, we know from the UN Sustainable Development Goals that sustainability is about a lot of different things, inequality, education, health and well-being, um, uh, ecological impact, uh, biodiversity loss, etc. So we need to be aware of this tunnel vision. And um, we can see here that there is sort of, if you see it like a like a like a graph, um, so unsustainable design is on on this side, and you can see that most green and zero carbon buildings, you know, they're amazing at being energy efficient, but actually they're still having a negative environmental impact or and social impact perhaps if their focus was just on this carbon tunnel vision. And then if we sort of meet all the UN sustainable development goals and have holistic sustainable architecture, we're just kind of being good enough, you know, not bad, not going into the negative, but maybe we could look at restorative design and, you know, how can we actually have positive social impact, positive environmental impact um, and positive economic impact as well, as we'll be speaking about today. So we know that we uh, are often in a linear economy where we take, we make, we use, we dispose of it and, uh, and we pollute. And what we're looking at is, is to be in a circular economy where materials are seen as being reused or if they're not going to be reused, they, reused, they actually biodegrade and they go back into the earth. So they're part of a circular economy and that's what architects are looking at for buildings. And more and more products and more and more um, services and transport are looking at this circular economy, looking at green alternatives, alternatives that address the climate and biodiversity issues that we're facing. And um, the economics of biodiversity, the Descriptor Review, highlighted to us the great impact we're having on natural capital. We are so reliant for um, for of our economy is so reliant on this natural capital that's available to us but deple depleting this natural capital is not doing any of us any favors and we're actually going to lose a lot of a lot of money a lot of natural wealth if we don't address this biodiversity issue that we're facing so um it's not only for other creatures it's actually for us as well um, spending time in a forest is these days called forest bathing. So enjoying, you know, enjoying time in the natural world is, is what we love to do. And we know that um, it has all sorts of benefits, integrating green infrastructure in our built environment. There's um, stormwater retention when there's heavy periods of rain. These, this green infrastructure is able to absorb uh, this water uh, rather than overwhelming and flooding our cities, um, increasing biodiversity, sheltering buildings to increase the energy efficiency. 
alleviating air pollution. Plants can filter air pollution, um, giving us amenity space, that forest bathing feeling, but while we're in cities, while we're experiencing our buildings. Uh, psychological calming and then if we make these plants edible even better uh, we have closed loop waste management of the food system we can reconnect people with food and food production and where it comes from uh, increase access to affordable fresh food and and reduce greenhouse gas emissions and ecological footprint of the food system so lots of lots of benefits we spend 90% of our lives inside buildings. What if we spent the time we spent in and around buildings can give us therapeutic benefits like forest bathing? You know, can we design buildings in that way? The really amazing places that we want to be in and are actually good for us. And the studies have shown the positive impact of, uh, of, of viewing plants and, and having plants around you. Um, this is a classic one from Ulrich from 1984, and more have come from after this study as well, that having a, a, a view of nature actually improved the, um, the uh, inc increased the uh, well-being of the patients, and they actually recovered faster, those who had views of um, nature rather than views of a brick wall. Um, and biophilic design is trying to think about ways that we can integrate the green infrastructure in our buildings, around our buildings and within our built environment, looking at different senses, um, smells, textures and so on from the natural world. So when you hear from, about biophilic design, this is what is trying to look at, these different things that when we're in a forest, what kind of feelings are we getting and what's around us, what sounds are around us and so on. Now, biomimicry is a little bit different. Biomimicry is about learning from nature. So learning from patterns in nature, and that might sort of give us some interesting structures for, for architecture that we're, that we're designing. So it's learning from how nature works, like the lotus leaf effect for windows, self-cleaning windows, and so on. Um, so that's biomimicry, different from biophilic design. Of course, we have nature in art. Um, um, this is a very famous Vincent van Gogh, as you know. Um, so nature has inspired us in art. Nature has inspired us in fabrics. Um, we want nature all around us. Um, and, and, it's, and throughout history, it's been the case. Um, and Ebenezer Howard uh, picked this up and um, we know that nature in the built environment is, is really important. Um, and he looked at this in 1902, where he looked at the concept of the garden city, which some of you might have heard about, bringing um, the countryside where into where people live, um, looking at the town, country, and bringing the town and country together. So if, to increase health and well-being um, and make our cities more desirable to live in. And his garden city concept was about, um, uh, you know, integrating food production through allotments around these sort of satellite towns. Um, and then the, the central city is where people go and work. So these are some ideas that, that, uh, that Howard thought, well, you know, this is fantastic. We, have, we live sort of out in the countryside and then we, we travel in to work in, in cities. So it's sort of um, that that's what the garden city concept was trying to look at that where we live and where we dwell that's where we have nature and then we travel into cities to work and that's where the pollution is so this was sort of early ideas of how we can think about how we live amongst nature but not quite there in terms of really understanding what the issues are and then there's the city of Chandigarh with in, in India that uh, that was one of Le Corbusier's ideas and the inspirations to to integrate uh, blue infrastructure and green infrastructure in this in this new city that was being designed um, and looking at um, buildings that are obviously uh, Le Corbusier style. So we, we have the sort of architecture there um, and amazing ideas in terms of, uh, of thermal mass to, to for shading and creating these, these areas for, for people to enjoy. Um, but it's sort of, we don't see much nature in this image. So Chandigarh was mostly about viewing nature. So 
architecture is about the archi- the architecture the architects trying to create and we view nature so rather than nature being part of the architecture it's more like we want nature to be around us so that that was the view as well similar to the garden city and then architects start, around this time similar time architects started looking at buildings integrated with nature so this is a famous falling water by flank Frank Lloyd Wright, and um, he looked at sort of uh, integrating the architecture with where the waterfall is and sort of um, really trying to see how the architecture can connect with the natural world around it. So uh, the buildings integrated with nature was being explored. And then we have buildings that connect us with nature. So this is uh, this is a, uh, an office space that's sort of immersed in a forest and, and wanting to connect us with the natural world around it. That's why there's this, gla- this glass design. This is in Spain. Um, and the idea was to feel like you're connected with nature. And um, this is a kindergarten in Japan and um, the building is again connected with the natural world um, where there's a tree in the middle of the, the playground and the, the, the children can run around it and it's sort of they could climb on the branches and it's, it's sort, it becomes part of the architecture. Um, so you can see how the architect is trying to bring nature into the building design and part of the experience. A very popular nursery that has had huge economic benefits, benefits as well for the kindergarten. Um, and this is the kindergarten's rooftop where the children are, are able to go and play up in the rooftop as well. So you can see they're in a very dense urban setting, but their kindergarten feels like they're, they're in a forest. So it, it's quite fantastic for them. And we have Vo Chong Nia, an architect who's very much inspired about connecting to nature, um, bringing nature into the architecture. And these these blocks are separate rooms of a dwelling. So the living room, the kitchen, the dining room. And um, uh, the architect is inspiring people or forcing the occupants to actually go outside to get to another room. And they can do that with this with the climate that this uh, building is in, in Vietnam. They're able to have this sort of going outside without feeling cold and it sort of makes you get fresh air as you're experiencing your home and then you also feel surrounded by by the natural world. And uh, this architect has also looked at passive strategies, the benefits of having green um, green infrastructure on buildings and what and how this benefits um, natural ventilation. This is a hot and humid climate, but um, the plants can help with the the airflow um, and that reduces the need for air conditioning. And there's also high thermal mass in terms of the materials that are used in order to absorb the sun's energy, as well as having this natural ventilation. Um, and buildings connected to nature is part of Maggie, the Maggie Centers brief. Maggie Centers are centers for people who have cancer and they're within hospitals in the UK. They're separate buildings where cancer patients can go and have their consultations. And one of the key parts of Maggie Centers is the uh, their brief is that the architect needs to design in a way that the patients feel like they're connected with the natural world. And it's such a, it's such a haven when you go to these Maggie centers. Um, the model has the business model is incredibly ex- successful, and more and more hospitals in the UK want to have Maggie centers on their sites. Um, and they're sort of they're they're almost like natural havens within these mass concrete um, hospital buildings that we have here. And um, what makes me really frustrated about this is why do we need to wait until we get cancer in order to experience buildings like this? It should be part of the brief for, for all of architecture to make us feel connected with the natural world. And um, it brings health and well-being benefits as well as reducing um, carbon emissions. So we know it makes sense in many different ways. This is another example of um, uh, a Maggie Center. 
and um, more and more hospitality um, hospitality firms, hotels, and so on are um, connecting, uh, designing buildings connected to nature because research has shown that this is what people want. It, it's um, it's really desirable for customers, and uh, people are willing to spend good money to to be in places that make them make them feel connected with the natural world. Um, uh, and also um, companies are taking this on for their employees um, to integrate. Uh, this is Persona in Japan. Um, uh, they, uh, it's, a, um, I think, well, it's, a, well, it's an office building. They don't specialize in growing food, but they wanted to integrate uh, food production for their employees to experience food growing all around them when they're working. And this improves their productivity. They can eat the food in their cafeteria. They can be part of workshops as, uh, as part of sort of learning about how to grow, grow food. And it's, it's really quite successful. Um, and the, and it sort of retains employees as well, as well as increasing productivity. Um, what's really important with um, integrating green infrastructure is the maintenance. Um, and, and this is an example in, in China where they um, integrated plants on these balconies um, and they uh, they ended up having a huge issue with mosquitoes because of the maintenance. They didn't maintain um, the areas where making sure that the um, water water didn't pool in certain parts of the balconies. So that then you're obviously when we're areas where water pool, there's still water. You can get mosquito eggs in there. So maintenance is very key for integrating green infrastructure, making sure that there, there is um, a, a maintenance regime and the types of plants that are used as well. So, so that's something to bear in mind. And um, green infrastructure can save us a lot of money. Uh, this was a study done by the city of Melbourne, um, valuing green design, actually putting quantifying the value of it. And you can see per square meter how much money that these different interventions um, save, save clients and the energy uh, money from the energy savings as well. So it, it's quite fantastic. And this is um, an incredibly successful um, uh, uh, block of flats in Milan. They they sell for that they're, they're not affordable in the sense. So when we look about in, look at inequalities on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, because these flats were so popular, then that increased the price of them. But it's um, it just shows why this green infrastructure makes economic sense again. Um, and we spoke about regenerative design earlier, and there are different layers to regenerative design, and um, ecosystem services are within that, within each of these layers. Um, and we can, if we can design buildings that are generous, like trees, so they filter air, they provide shade, um, they 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 sort of um, provide habitat for us and and other species um, they look at, uh, they filter water um, if we can see buildings like trees and cities like forests that's what we mean by ecosystem symbiotic relationships happening in cities for ecosystems for flora and flora to fly thrive these buildings all need to speak to each other and um, the green infrastructure needs to be connected and this is why we're working with ecologists and conservationists to see how this can really happen how can cities truly be ecosystems as a whole and individual buildings as well thank you for listening it's been a pleasure talking to you Thank you very much, Mina. You managed to press an enormous amount of material and um, passion, which when people use it in their CV, I'm not always sure, but definitely that was real passion, um, into a relatively short space of time. Um, I, I liked, in particular, I'd, I'd like to drill down a little bit deeper on some of the things that, some of the stuff you had to say about Japan, 
particularly fascinated me. Um, and I'm sure everybody else will have their own uh, questions later. But um, time is a pressing. So with thanks, can we now, can I now um, ask Mike to step up to the virtual floor? Okay, so Mila's given us a great introduction, and I, I will pass over quickly some of the issues that obviously we all share as designers in this, this realm, uh, because you've heard it, but I, no, no harm reinforcing a few points. When you talk about green development and with any subject, it's a good idea to start with uh, what's the idea of what it is, and um, there's the example of the Bosco Verticale in Milan, uh, which is so, so famous and iconic. And I, we are at the iconic stage in these things. It's getting things going. We're not mainstream yet. So these images have their function to get people to think about the whole issue. Um, but as Mina says, you know, th there's different aspects to green development sustainability. To me, in very practical terms, as, as a designer working with developers, um, it, it's common sense stuff like don't create a problem that's going to cost money to solve and that's going to create negative factors, blight to rental value, social economic harm. If you don't have to, why create a problem? Intelligent development, you know, I mean, sustainability becomes rather hackneyed and can mean lots of things. I mean, it's been a great definition, but simple things like don't create a problem. Next thing is an idea that most people don't think about, which is not just creating something new that's nice and everyone has a great time and likes it, but repairing past damage. We're already at a place where there's so much harm, you go into urban areas where the, where the damage is done. So there's a tremendously positive feeling to this. You know, for my early days in consultancy, it was all damage limitation. And actually, when you go to a site like that image there in, New in, in, in Nottingham, a very contaminated cycle factory site that became with Michael Hopkins, the scheme we worked on some years ago, I don't want to say how many years, uh, this decontaminated site uh, and a new campus, Biophilic, it's actually shown as the front cover on a book by Keller on Biophilic Design. But just at one point of this, that all the soils were recycled from that contaminated land and de and are depolluted in the process. So the idea of regenerative process, it's not just about holding the line or creating something new and nice, it's repairing. And all the ecosystem services side of it, I, I think that we all know about you know production of food and production of wood and all these sorts of things, but the, the, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2000, some, you know, a couple of decades ago, it really emphasized then it wasn't just about the basics of life and survival. It was all about culture. It was about society. It was about psychological well-being, productivity, and all these much more complex social issues. So it was, you know, identified some time ago that, you know, ecosystem services isn't just about making sure we've got enough food to eat. So what are the global trends? The global trends are, as Mina says, very, very strong in this area for anyone getting, wanting to get involved in the Commonwealth. We're over half urban now. By 2050, in the Commonwealth, we could be 66%. Europe and Southeast Asia are way above that already, about 70 plus. But interestingly, you know, if you look at where the growth is going to happen, Africa only at 40%, South Asia 33 So in, in terms of the focus, if those areas develop to the level we're at and get it all wrong and do bad polluting development, we're in trouble. So I think this is a really important point in terms of our international portfolio and thinking. So we're going to get increased noise, water, air pollution, and this is on a mega scale if it's writ large over these areas of these developing countries as well. We've talked about climate change uh, briefly uh, and the biodiversity climate crises. Um, and the importance of the biodiversity systems as sinks for carbon dioxide. Um, you, you'd have to be brain dead or, or in a box somewhere not to have seen what's been going on in the media with all of this. Ecotourism is another nice example. Lots of people on this panel are interested in tourism one way or another. Ecotourism is one of the fastest growing tourism sectors. It's small, but it's very fast growing, it's expected to grow over 14% to 2027. And one small part of that, which is regenerative ecotourism, where people put a bit more money into their, um, their visit or whatever, restoring where they've gone so they can go home saying, I've made it better. And when I come back, it's going to be better than I left it. New sort of thinking like this. And that there is a significant market for this amongst the people who have that sort of disposable income. And perhaps you might argue the, the luxury to think about such things. And then, of course, environmental tech, that has grown massively. If you look at this, this graph of tech, you know, the, the, the non-environmental tech in terms of the speed of development is behind the green tech. Everybody, there's a massive growth in that area. It's not my own speciality, but it's, it's a very strong growth area. So it, this is from my own perspective. What characterizes what I would call a good green development? Some years ago, I contributed a book chapter to this book with Ken Yang and, and, and Arthur Spector, 
trying to understand what drove it and then how do you measure it? And, and if you start talking about the green stuff and nature, of course, it's all sort of wishy-washy and, 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 and uh, uh, soft, if you like. So it's not sort of seen as metricized in the same way as bits of architecture might be. Um, but, you know, it can be, and I thought it should be, because if you do decide and metricize and advance what you might get, um, you get more chance of it actually happening, <laughs> strangely enough. Here's an example of a scheme that we did with Kenny Yang for a new government headquarters in Korea, South Korea in Gongji. And the idea here was that the green stuff was infrastructure at all levels. There, as Mina says, you've got the vegetation working throughout the building footprint that you've got, despite big open areas of hard surfacing, you've got an awful lot of green stuff there. But at the same time, it's functional. And so we looked at what we developed as a biodiversity matrix and looked at all the flora and fauna and said, well, if you want that fauna to be there because it maybe cheers somebody up or maybe eats insects you don't want around or whatever it may be, then you've got to think about it. And how do you actually decide what, what do they need? How do you make sure they, they're there or make uh, more sure that they will be there? And the next step from all of this is that the ecosystem services that uh, all this stuff is giving us, as Mina described, um, uh, th there's many of them, and it's complex. So you might get air filtering, water pollution, water filtering, um, biophilic design, and of course they're all happening together. So more and more, these these systems are developing now around the world for metricizing all this and looking at it as co-variables, and actually getting into uh, dreadful things like computer modeling. So. Here is an example of Green Pass in, uh, in Europe, which uh, Gary Grant knows a lot more about than I do, but is essentially a system for trying to optimize the provision of the services. So there you're really getting down into sort of architect speak of how you get this green stuff to do the best it can to give the most value to, to a development. Another way of looking at it, which, uh, which Ken Yang likes a, a lot, is saying, well, we've always known about technological infrastructure, roads, you know, IT cycles and everything. A lot of us know, know quite a bit and decent amount about drainage uh, and sewers and everything, um, uh, fragrant harbour, et cetera. And, um, uh, but interestingly, the green stuff seen as an infrastructure, you know, seeing it not just as, oh, it's the greening up around the bits you're left over with, but seeing it as a functional bit, just as much as the mechanical electrical engineering is the, the way we're talking about. And uh, and then the people, you know, the people as the city and the people interact with all these things in ways that are not just uh, passive bystanders. So it is an interaction. So it's it seems very simplistic when you say it, but actually you design differently if you think in this way. And one of the things that uh, taking the whole biophilic design canon that Mina explained to the next level is a book that I, I edited for Ken Yang called Saving the Planet by Design. And the basic thesis of this is going beyond biomimesis to ecomimesis, the idea that if ecosystems are so darn clever and can sort out things and, and, and have homeostatic process and keep everything level, as, 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 uh, as uh, Julia said at the beginning, if that's what we're trying to do. We can learn a lot from ecosystems. But we're not just natural ecosystems. A city isn't that. It's tech. It's a mixture. And then you get this sort of mixture between the nature and the technical, which Ken Yang, uh, rather amusingly, refers to as sort of like the bionic man, a sort of eco-cyborg. And the idea that you're sort of reacting in a, in a way where it's not just one and another bit. They're working together synergistically. And I have to just quote this because it's quite, this is Ken Yang speak, a, a go-go. For a resilient, durable, sustainable future of human society, we need to repurpose, reinvent, redesign, remake, recover our human-made world so that our built environment is benignly and seamlessly bio-integrated with nature to function synergistically with it. Worth thinking about what all that means. So have a look at the book. It's also on audio books and I don't get any royalties. This is an example of this in very simple terms. So this is a green roof with some solar panels. Now, the important very point about this being an eco-cyborg is that the, 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 the panels help shade the roof and provide niches for wildlife and pollinators and one thing or another, but the, the green roof cools the panels and a cooler panel produces more electricity. So here's an example of a synergy between the nature and the tech and actually starting to treat the green infrastructure as part of the fabric of the building in a functional sense. Now, economic benefits. This is an economic chamber, and we're interested in where the benefits come. Over a decade ago, gosh, time does pop fly, I wrote this for the British Council for Offices with Ken Yang, Designing for Biodiversity, Productivity and Profit. I chose the title. So in other words, developments of business are huge. You know, they can have a lot of effect on positive bio for biodiversity, but they can also uh, can do a huge amount for the business, the biodiversity. So it's a two-way street. 
this company, check it out after this, Terrapin Bright, Bright Green New York City, have written very available um, documents on this as to why this makes economic sense when you do it in development for all different actors in the game. And I really recommend their stuff. But basically, in simple terms, it, it's, it's this. It's you exposed to high quality nature, you have some physiological effects, you have some cognitive effects of that, and that can lead to very measurable increases in human productivity, creativity, human health, reduced absenteeism, which of course goes to bottom line. All you need to do is go to Apple headquarters or Google headquarters, they get it, they're already doing it because they know it makes money. This is an example in Putrajaya, which uh, my, my, uh, was mentioned earlier in the introductions. Suasana, it's a green office plot with all kinds of shading systems and whatever. We applied our biodiversity metric, uh, biodiversity uh, a target system to this. But what I also did was try to convince them in terms of using tr value transfer analysis, saying these are all these thousands of studies are now showing these effects on people's productivity. Fantastic data on productivity in Malaysia are available. 6,000 office workers multiplied up by these other studies and the benefits you get. And then say, well, it's Malaysia. Let's change it. Let's be very conservative. Let's halve that effect. And tell you what, let's be even more conservative. Let's halve that again. And, 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 you know, because value transfer is always dangerous between cultures and whatever. And even then, these office block would save the, the owners of those businesses two million sterling per annum in lost productivity. Uh, it, you know, people just, you know, idling, which these buildings have been shown if they have biophilic design, uh, reduce those effects. Now, don't take my word for it. This is an initiative in the Wild West End, uh, and it's some very serious players here. Um, uh, which you can see at the top right, you know, big name, not exactly known as tree huggers, these guys. And yet they, on their own, their own uh, initiative, have set out this green initiative in the West End of London because they realise retail has changed, people shop online. Why the hell should you go to the street and do shopping? The reason is because you're trying to get another experience, a whole different thing. So your environment becomes very important. It's not just a sort of an incidental thing you put up with to go and buy your noodles. You're doing it as part of the experience. And so this is their own initiative. They, they, they subsidize and they promote the development of all these sorts of infrastructures. And it enhances footfall and property values. And they are serious players in the, in, in the commercial market in London. So you've got to listen to these guys. Here's an example of what you do if you get it wrong. I mean, this is East, it's not far from Paddington Station in London. And you've got a street designed for cars that uh, mostly is just a, a fairly um, a ineffectual parking lot with hardly any traffic going in the streets. And that's a waste of space, heats up in the summer um, and all the rest of it. And is you know, just a, a very unpleasant place to be. As part of the City of Westminster's competition, we suggested repurposing the streets, turn them into linear parks with food growing, social activity, still can get your fire tenders through these streets if necessary and so on and so forth. But actually this sort of thing plays into the hands of places like um, Church Street and an amazing place in London with fantastic um, uh, cultural diversity. Uh, you need about 12 languages to get a cup of tea there. I mean, it's fantastic. And uh, you, you can actually start playing these sorts of designs in the cultural lens of saying, well, what kind of gardens, what, what do people from different cultures want to see as part of their biophilic canon, if you like. Here's an example in London that we did, you know, back in the, the, the turn of the millennium, we're replacing a river wall for the Greenwich Millennium uh, work and the peninsula in Greenwich in East London. Could have just built a wall, instead of which we built a terrace, covered it in vegetation. Vegetation gets covered by the tide a couple of times a day, and it turns into a fish nursery. So sea bass, which lots of people like to eat, the babies grow up in estuaries. And so this is an artificial sea bass nursery, which we created over a kilometre and a half long largest artificial sea bass nursery works for all, it raises property values, people are prepared to pay for it in prepared this to pay studies, and uh, looks very attractive, birds singing, etc. Another example, Athletes Village in East London, which is mentioned, an entire system from roofs to, to lakes uh, of treating and soaking up the water as in Beijing with their sponge city concept, where you filter the water through pools, from the roof, you see down into the lakes where multiple systems treat the water, also becomes a nice place. So this is a very young image, um, so it's, it's developed much more since then. And, you know, the benefits of this have been increased footfall, retail values along there, the sort of businesses that set up shop, the quality of that feeling, and, uh, you know, a very, very strong positive discrimination thing in the private rental sector. So the people owning this development have long-term interest in investing in the landscape because they want people to stay in those rental properties and they want people to keep the place nice. Another scheme that I was involved in years ago, the High Line in New York City, very famous example. I climbed onto it when it was a derelict railway and I thought, why not turn it into a park? Wrote a report about this. This is um, Field Operations Park using all the same sorts of plants. 
And just the magnet effect that Mina was talking about, this is now the most visited park in the United States of America per square yard. And people fly America to New York just to see it, believe it or not. So it, it has positive and negative effects on, on, on prices, of course, you know, some price people out of the market, but the economic impact of this is what's written about. Um, and just to end on, on a couple of examples from the Commonwealth here in India, um, good friends of mine, uh, the Godridge family, um, in the uh, eastern side of Mumbai Peninsula here, set up 100 years ago a factory for the local uh, uh, workers and uh, over the years have developed it. One of the two major Parsi families that, that, that founded the industries of India along with Tata. And they, they had a benign view of social engineering, social en enterprise. They wanted to do something for, for, the, for the workers so that they would get more out of the workers and the workers would be healthier and happier. So they gave them schools. They gave them um, uh, hospitals they're building now. Um, this is one very low energy green development. But very importantly, they protected all these mangroves. And um, 100 years ago, people thought they were barking mad when, when they did this. And they said, why on earth are you preparing all those swamps and mosquitoes? But when the storms came and the sea levels rose, this is the one bit of Mumbai that didn't flood. And this is the ecosystem services of the mangroves to that Kazuli development. Just to finish, and I've reached beyond 15 minutes, Mayor Culpa, Mayor Maxima Culpa, but I will just finish in this last line. In our industry, Gary's, mine, and Mina's, it's astonishing when you sit down and think of how many different types of discipline are now engaged in this huge endeavor, as, as Julia said. There's commercial planners and structures. They can't just sit on the trial. They need to understand a lot more of this stuff to know what to commission and what to ask. Architects and eco-architects and master planning has, is different to eco-master planning. So all of that is changing. Ecological assessment design, my own sphere. Landscape architects moving away from the general aesthetic landscape drivers to a much more holistic approach to their discipline. Soil scientists, because everything ultimately ends up with the soil, and that's the biggest ecosystem of all, and we're losing soils. Urban agriculture, we've talked of, and permaculture. Engineering of water systems, we're doing it with nature as well, a whole brand new area of hydrology. Green transport planning, where are you going to take your green routes if, you, if not through lovely landscape? You don't want to be traveling in sustainable transport or cycling through a mess. Decontamination, waste processing, material science and tech, you know, so smart cities, how they integrate with nature and nature and technology work together in a synergistic way. Modeling the services, um, natural capital accounting, psychological research, community engagement, even cultural heritage curation like heritage trees in Singapore or Monaco. Human geographers trying to work out how people react with this and how to get the most benefit out of that socially and culturally. Social enterprise people looking for different interest groups. And then at the bigger scale, international partnering for these sorts of endeavors, transboundary partnering like Singapore, Malaysia, carbon trading, uh, even at larger mega city scale and eco city region scale. And of course, academics and environmental research. So not much really, um, take a pick. Thank you, Mikey, for that very slow paced, concise, Exposition. Um, I thought Mina was putting a lot into um, a short period of time, but um, anyway, there it, there it is. I'm actually going to break a rule here because normally we just, especially since we're sort of running out of time a bit, Gary is kind of the, the VIP speaker. But having said that, um, I, I just want to ask you one specific thing, Mike. Um, you know, Talking about all these benefits, if you're in the development business, as I have been for many, many decades, the first thing that you ask is, you can be very eloquent, and you are, but how can you quantify this in a way that everybody can agree and accept so that we know how much, it's all very well saying it's bottom line as well. But, you know, how? And because people disagree about this, even it, when it comes to things that are nothing to do with ecology. I mean, when it comes just to looking at the stock market or something. So all of these various benefits, how can you persuade um, people that you have a, a, a serious way of measuring economic benefit to companies? Because after all, I mean, of course, you're all companies as well, but it's the developers who actually build things. I mean, green design has been going for quite a long time, but it's still relatively new. And the economics analysis that goes with it is perhaps newer. But it, there is a burgeoning array of tools uh, available for looking at this sort of thing. 
um, which uh, to, 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 to place economic values on these sort of interventions we do. Um, a lot of academic institutions have produced what they call ecosystem valuation toolkits, and um, they can choose to focus on different aspects of the ecosystem service thing that developers may or may not be more or less interested in. I mean, developers may be interested in philosophies. They may be interested because they're passing on that benefit in their marketing literature to whoever's going to occupy the building. They could be interested in it because they've got a government regulation to comply with, which is very much the case in, 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 the, in the West. Um, and they could be doing it because they want a, a higher uh, certification rating, which helps, um, you know, like lead platinum or whatever that they, they they get extra extra brownie points for doing, and, and it has an economic benefit. So there can be lots of. It's very hard to say what one thing is, sure. but um, you know, back in the the the, the, the sort of data that the, the simplest one that I use all the time is I'm no mathematician or economist, but value transfer. You know, studies that have been done somewhere and then saying, well. It's not the same here, but if it were vaguely the same, it would be these sorts of effects. Um, back in 2005, how this has been going on, the Council for Architecture and the Built Environment in the UK um, produced a document called Does Money Grow on Trees? And in that book, they, um, they, they looked at lots of case studies, previous case studies, a lot of case studies they did especially for the report, and found a 5 to 7% uplift in values of identical properties in every other way you could possibly uh -huh. measure it. Um, when they were next to a high quality green space park to ones that didn't have it. But that range went up to 30%. Okay. So sorry, sorry, Mikey, I, I knew I was wrong to break my rule because I think probably in the Q&A, Gary and you will answer it anyway. So um, parking that on one side, uh, can I now thank you again for that uh, extraordinary um, tour de raison of everything um, and ask Gary to... Um, to take his uh, virtual place. I'm going to uh, be more focused. Uh, so we've had a good overview, I think. I think. So what I want to do today is to talk about green infrastructure audit as a technique of, uh, of seeing where green infrastructure can uh, have good impact or where it can be feasibly, feasibly created and also to give you a case study of a green infrastructure audit in London uh, and one of the interventions that came out of that. Uh, so the, uh, the, the area that we're going to look at is the Victoria in southwest London. Um, this was the first business improvement district to commission a green infrastructure audit, and I was fortunate enough to work on that with a, another company called Land Use Consultants. And as a result of that, we were able to uh, devise a, a method of doing this, which was then which was then to be written up by others. And so that that can be downloaded if people are interested in green infrastructure audits. Um, and then that has subsequently formed the basis of quite a number of other projects. So just briefly, it's worth thinking about the business improvement, improvement dish, something that came out of the United States, I believe. London itself has 47 business imp improvement bricks. And these are areas where businesses pay a contribution and sit on a, on a, a board, which is also attended by the local authority. And in the past, it used, used to be attracting shoppers and so, so on. Uh, keeping places neat and tidy, but increasingly, business improvement districts have become more and more and more sophisticated, uh, and it, be it became uh, it became so sophisticated that they were starting to ask uh, for for these investigations uh, a few years ago. Uh, so, the idea of of um, uh, the green infrastructure audit for a business improvement district. Is to to see you know what sorts of environmental improvements uh, you could you could make to the area, uh, where they could occur, um, and and perhaps to get a a good baseline of what you already have. And of course, the process of auditing for green infrastructure is very helpful in itself because it, it opens up conversations with different departments within the local authority. Uh, with different business, businesses, it, more businesses, it means that you can knock on doors and ask people if this is something that they'd be interested in. 
So um, uh, the London, uh, the mayor of London was very keen on this. The Greater London Authority uh, paid, paid for the, uh, these audits. Uh, there were grants for that. Um, and as I say, the idea was to look at existing, existing green infrastructure, to look at the benefits of green infrastructure, and also to look at uh, the greening of buildings, especially grooves. And um, we'll come, come on to that. So this is uh, uh, this is the first, as I say. Uh, you can you can download all of these if you're interested in the details. There are hundreds of pages in here, so I'm giving you a very very brief uh, uh, summary of, of what went on. So the beginning of this process, and by the way, there are dozens of, of maps and, and so on in the report. So you're only going to be uh, seeing a couple of them today. The beginning of this is to look at what green infrastructure you already have in your district and, and where the local authority are, have long-term aspirations for new green infrastructure. So this is uh, what you already have. You can see there, there, is, there are street trees marked in this part of Victoria. Uh, there are some, there are some uh, and gardens, they're all there. And the move um, areas are areas where in the local plan, local plan here in Westminster has proposals for ground level parks and gardens. So if you like, this is the old fashioned um, local authority government greening agenda. You've got some trees, you've got some parks, you might be able to have some parks in the future, but probably you won't because there'll be pressures and, and other, uh, other requirements. So that's, if you like, the old fashioned approach uh, then we um, then we we start to look at the city in three dimensions um, and what we find is that the real greening the real improvements come when you include the buildings and this is an analysis of those buildings which could be retrofitted with green roofs uh, and green walls um, it's quite an interesting process because it involves engineers. Um, about a third of the commercial buildings in uh, London can be retrofitted with green roofs because they have sufficient strength in their structure to do that. And in other cities, this can be much higher, especially where you have a pre preponderance of reinforced concrete and so on. So, so. Um, uh, uh, this analysis looks at buildings where you can definitely retrofit with green roofs and where you might be able to, subject to certain technical requirements. And, and what it shows you is that if you're really serious about climate change adaptation, adaptation uh, dealing with uh, heat waves, dealing with surface water flooding, the greening of the buildings is essential because you though it's great to get what we can at ground level in the streets, we can't uh, solve the prob problem with them. We've got to look at the buildings. So fascinating bit of work. It's being re repeated now elsewhere. Um, um, buildings have, have got to be part of that equation for climate change adaptation. So out of this uh, project, a number of really uh, uh, nice, nice uh, uh, interventions. Nigel Dunnett, the famous uh, horticulturalist, some of his first rain gardens in Victoria that came out of this project. Um, there were some green roofs, as I say. Uh, but we we also started to look at the idea of retrofitting green walls. So where we saw a blank wall. Um, this is a Victorian hotel called the, uh, the Rubens at the Palace Hotel. Uh, the hotel was um, partially demolished in the Edwardian period when the road was widened and that left these blank walls. Uh, we went to the, the owners of this hotel and others saying, you have this, this boring blank wall, we could green this for you. Most owners felt it was too expensive or, or, or perhaps didn't understand the idea, but we were fortunate that this owner, owner uh, it's a privately owned hotel chain, Red Carnation Hotel chain, this uh, owner um, uh, made a decision, yes, I'd like to do that, when we showed her what could be done, 
Um, so it was a nice, easy process. No committees, no, no boards, just one owner that, that agreed that she'd like this. Um, so once I got over the shock of being told, yes, we, we want to go forward, because, of course, most of the time uh, people tend to say no <laughs> to begin with. So getting someone to say yes after 10 minutes is, is quite a shock. But once we, we got over that, um, we went ahead, uh, made the designs, um, and uh, a, a system of, of growing vegetation on walls, a uh, modular system with boxes being it's irrigated, this was installed. Now, uh, at this time, green walls were relatively new in London. There was some controversy about them. People felt that they were wasting energy. They felt that they were wasting potable water. water. Some people argued they weren't good for nature. So in this case, we made sure that there was a very high, um, uh, long list of plants used. Sorry, the, the slides are jumping around there. Long list of plants used, including, including uh, plants included in the uh, RHS, the Royal Horticultural Society's list of plants for pollinators. So, so of uh, plants to attract uh, pollinating insects like wild bees. So there's, you can see the geraniums are in flower in this wall to wall. So uh, dozens of species in there. So we're, in other words, it's not just ornamental, although it does look uh, spectacular. It's about helping pollinating insects, um, which do struggle to find habitat in, in the middle of city cities. Now, the next uh, objection was on uh, water. People argued, well, living walls waste potable water, drinking water. We would argue it's not entirely a waste if you are using drinking water because uh, you're getting evaporative cooling from, from these green walls and that cooling helps to reduce your reliance on air conditioning, uh, which saves energy. So by using a, a relatively small amount of, uh, of water, you're getting cooling. Benefit. But in this case, we were able to disconnect the downpipes from the roofs. It, uh, the, the, roof, the, the roof's green, there's too much equipment up there. So we're collecting rainwater, we're intercepting it and storing it. You can see there's a tank there on the first floor, and then that water is used to irrigate the wall. Um, and that's, that, that's worked very well. So we've, over, we've overcome objection. Um, people often ask me what the tank looks like. Uh, you know, as Mike says, there's a lot of different experts involved in this. So for those who like to see the tank, there it is. And this is what this is what looks like now. Um, it's matured somewhat. It, it's maintained um, uh, three or four times a year, depending on whether or not there's any problems. But it, it's like any garden. It needs a bit of gardening, a little bit of maintenance. And probably the un most unexpected uh, benefit of this green wall being that the hotel... Uh, use of air conditioning, especially in these wings, has fallen somewhat in summer. Uh, previously, the sun was be beating down these brick walls. Um, that heat is, is absorbed into the building, so it means people have to uh, run air conditioners and so on. So this is really keeping um, the sun's heat off of that building in the summer and, of course, providing the evaporative cooling uh, that I've mentioned. So um, as a result of this and other projects, uh, uh, green walls are really catching on now in London. You're seeing dozens of these um, in, in residential, commercial situations, um, housing as well. So um, it took a while. There's a lot of skepticism. There were some uh, bumps along the road, but we've now, but we've now at a point where we know how to do this. We can make, make it good for nature. Um, we can collect rainwater and water for if we need to, and we've been able to uh, simplify the maintenance in a way that makes it affordable. So that concludes my, uh, my case study. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Garrett. I, I, I thought the order in which we collectively chose to make this... Uh, uh, event, the presentations, uh, worked rather well because this was, after listening to all the important principles, um, we actually got that 
I mean, I, I, of course, I saw your slides in advance, and I, I must say that hotel is just totally extraordinary. Um, <clears throat> illustrates also an, uh, something that came up earlier. Um, I, I, I've forgotten whether it was Mikey or whoever who raised it, which is how you actually, you know, do things. I mean, it can look good, um, or maybe it was Mina. I mean, in China, there have been similar attempts, but um, sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't. But the direction seems to be very clear. And I congratulate you on um, on, on, on that particular success. And also, um, uh, hope that you'll do a specialist um, webinar with us just focusing on that um, some other time. So on that note, uh, perhaps we can go now to the um, Q&A session. There's a lot of material. I would urge, um, the, we've had some questions from the, um, from the, order, the audience, um, but there is uh, plenty of time to, a reasonable amount of time to, to put in more. So please do type in your questions, uh, folks. Uh, while I'm waiting for that, um, I'll exercise moderator's right and I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions first, if I may. Um, the first question I, I, I'd like to ask um, is actually for everybody. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking here a lot about the benefits and about the obvious advantages, but there are, there are obviously also difficulties. Um, so what are the biggest difficulties that you guys have faced in implementing, let me just call it green development projects, however you choose to define it, whether in the Commonwealth, which is obviously our focus here, or elsewhere in the world, um, let's, let's, let me start with Mike, just to be, just to be typical. Well, sure. I mean, I don't think it'll come surprise to anyone who's involved in in uh, urban uh, design development, redevelopment, that um, probably the most obvious problem one faces is um, this is extra cost. Why am I paying for this? You know, the capex cost and the models that people have in development projects, you know, don't allow for the, the say, holistic view of the of the of the benefits in in economic terms. Um, so another is the perceived cost of maintenance. Um, uh, and they, they see it as a, well, it's going to cost me a lot of money for specialist facilities management companies to look after this. And they're not thinking generally speaking in any kind of creative way about how the else that may might be done. I'll, I'll come back to that. And the third is, um, the opportunity costs, the opportunity cost in economics is when you're trying to change making guns to making butter, you know, you, you can get there, but if you can do one, you can do the other, but there's a cost of making the transition. And in some countries, and Germany is a good example, they've, the government has intervened. I know that's not something often that talks about in, in the context of Hong Kong in these senses, but they intervened to get things over the cost curve so that once something has been incentivized, becomes mainstream, costs drop. Not only do costs not only do drop because there's more stuff around for these green walls or whatever they may be, there's more skills available. There's a there's an industry that can do it, maintain it. So the whole thing becomes economically more approachable, and you can open it up. So it, it's a it's a combination of all these factors. Um, I'm like Gary. I try to get people. I mean, there's regulation that helps, and the and the, and the green infrastructure green. in in London, the the um, urban greening factor, which Gary's been behind developing, is a major change game changer in terms of the way architects are now having to change their architecture to accommodate it and they're all kicking and screaming about it but over time i am sure that that whole thing will become second nature and you'll they'll think no more about it than their standard approach they have to take anyway to things like m and e um, can i can i just interrupt and take you up on that a little bit mikey before i let the others in? um my own experience as a developer is that there is a dichotomy between um what the regulators say i mean for example in hong kong we have a we well, I, I don't want to mention the, the name but i mean we we have people who set standards and so forth which seems a little detached from reality sometimes and then there are there are the professionals with whom we work closely architects designers ecologists like yourselves um and they don't 
always seem to be talking the same thing. I mean, whereas we would were very, very happy to mix love for the eco, you know, for, for the for the for the planet and for ecology with bottom line profit and consumer acceptance on the one hand, um, with uh, professional endorsement and expertise. And I mean, it doesn't just apply to ecology, it applies to architecture, safety, many things. Uh, there are sometimes the, the, the obstacle is that there are very highly paid bureaucrats somewhere who, uh, you know, who sort of, I, I don't know whether that's true in other Commonwealth jurisdictions with which you've had dealings. I mean, I'm, quick comment on that. I, uh, we, do, we do need more seminars to elaborate on these. Every one of these questions is a seminar in itself. But just in very brief terms, this, this issue of language and the different goals and backgrounds of people involved in this overall cumulative social endeavour of building cities and looking after them. I've just written a book chapter because I felt so strongly about it for the Handbook of Urban Ecology, the Handbook, Handbook of Urban Ecology, about this thing of, multi, of working um, all the various parties involved and the way the angle they're coming at this from. And there are, uh, I, I, I talked in terms of um, axes of tension, um, sort of not so you want to think it's too much eco psycho babble, but basically the idea that the, the, the range of interests in doing this vary um, strongly between different disciplines, almost innately. I mean, you go into architecture, you go into engineering because you're on a different point in the scale of this. And that means that we're all coming at it from a slightly different you know, cultural, educational, and linguistic point of view. And I actually think that um, we need to have um, root and branch change in everything from the academic roles, like MENA is now part of that change, but REBA is very slow to take up on, and institutes when it comes to CPD in professions that are cross-disciplinary. I mean, if you want CPD- Okay, okay. well, I mean, sorry, since I, since I broke my own rule again by inter you know asking you to interrupt um let me go to mina because you mentioned uh, what's your what's your take mina on this one um, could you repeat the question please yeah sure right. um, i mean the, the question was basically that sometimes developers who want to use best practice they want to build something which is going to maybe they're bad people but i mean at least they know that they're consumers and good things, all the stuff you were talking about. Or maybe they're yeah. good people. Yeah. Um, and they employ great professionals in whichever discipline, but the, the government bureaucracy behind it, I mean, quite often you get appointed to that bureaucracy just in order to stop these things happening. Um, um, so I, I was just trying to get... Mike to say whether that he noticed this uh, tension, but I, I don't know what you, you you may have more experience being um, an academic. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The the sort of we find that policies, or well, in architecture practice, policies are key drivers for a lot of developers. So the go government policies actually help when it comes to green infrastructure, especially the type that Gary has developed in London, um, the urban uh, greening factor. Mm -hmm. And um, the sort of when, when planners demand, um, demand certain things in order to get planning permission, mm -hmm. that's when developers actually take it on because they have to, otherwise they can't have their development built. Um, what What's really a challenge for architects is to make sure that uh, this green infrastructure doesn't get value engineered out when it comes to the quantity survey valuing a project because what tends to happen is architects design the green infrastructure as a kind of bolt-on a, a bolt-on part of uh -huh. rather than it being an integral part of the design it's more like a bolt-on that if it's a bolt-on, then it can be taken off easily when it comes to saving uh -huh, money. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But if it's an integral part of the design, Agreed. like the Maggie Center's brief, they, they can't do that. Yeah, that's a good answer. Gary? Uh, what, we're, we're still answering the same qu question, aren't well, we? Well, we don't have to, or we can yeah, move yeah, on yeah. to the next one, of course. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, there is a cultural problem which goes back decades uh, where cities are not places for nature. And so that is built into the professional education of engineers, architects and so on. And instinct is always to say no to bringing more nature into towns. 
also there's a lot of fear about this kind of thing as of thing as well. so the culture is still against us if you like but when we we change the rules wow. for instance when the when green roofs were made an expectation by the mayor of london in 2010 that meant all new buildings in london have have green roofs on them by by default so that is now the rule in london london it's been for about 10 years so that means the construction industry in london is now expecting to see a green roof. So all the arguments about, well, we don't want to do this, we, we can't do it, uh, and all those reasons now are not there. With, with, the, with London, um, people, we have a problem with quality now, um, but we don't have mm -hmm. a problem with people saying we don't want to do it. Whereas if you go outside of London, to uh, one of the cities, uh, uh, you know, in the provinces in England, say, or Wales, people will still say the things they used to say in London 10 years ago. We can't do this. We won't do this. We don't want to do this. We, we cut it um, and so on. But of course, the reasons that people give, most of them are not real concerns. They melt away. As soon as people are obliged to do this, they just, they don't say anything. They just do it. Um, so, well, so that is so that is well, a remarkable. Yeah, well, Gary. I mean, if you force people to do things, so of course they'll do it. But I mean, it's better to persuade them. It's in there. Yeah, as you yeah. were doing very well earlier. That it's in their own best interests, right? Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 yeah. But if if I may, I may just finish the point. The point I'm making is I agree with you. And in fact, even in London, it's an expectation. If you really, really don't want to, you can hire a lawyer to make the case that you won't do it. But but uh, um, the point I'm making is that the, re the reason people give for not doing it are not really serious reasons in, in nearly every case. When you yeah, analyze okay. it, when, yeah, when you sure. get into the detail, that's the point I'm making. Uh, mm, they're they're not... Point. Not the real reason. The real reason is cultural. Mm. It's not yeah. tackle. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, moving from that briefly, I'd like to say that I've been asking these questions from a very developer's community type of standpoint, because when push comes to shove, it is, after all, developers who built it. But you guys are all business people as well. You're professionals. You have businesses to run. Right. So and green design, as uh, I think a couple of you said, is is, is, is now, um, if not universally welcomed, it is mainstream. No question about that at all. Um, do you find at the minute with all the other problems going on in the world, um, it is not just sort of stubborn developers wanting to cut costs but but people just not having much money and with with covid and then the geopol geopolitics and all the rest of it i mean are are, are you finding it um, your business models as professionals more more challenging and what about talent for example what about recruiting people I mean, is this easier or less easy i have no idea a anybody to go first on that uh, well, I'll go first because I am trying to recruit someone at the mo moment. So, uh, if anyone's out there who wants to work with Urban Greening, uh, then uh, let let me know. Uh, it was the the uh, um, the, the opportunity still there? Uh, it's, very, it's very difficult to find people with the right uh, combination of, of talents and the experience that, that's required because this is relatively new. So, of mm. course, there are plenty of people. Uh, landscape <laughs> architects, architects, engineers, and so on around. Uh, but having the the right uh, kind of attitude, I suppose, and and certainly having experience in this it is qu still quite rare. Um, so we definitely need um, we we need more people with the right kind of training. We probably need new kinds of degrees being created. I like the ecological engine. Ecological engine. I meet from. Uh, uh, Germany and uh, Russia. Russia um, has ecological engineers. Uh, as a, a power. So, uh, um, you know, there's some interesting degrees out there. But also in the construction and horticultural industry, industry with problems as well, because there's a shortage of ecologically minded people, um, because business as usual doesn't with this kind of thing. Uh, and most of my problems now 
are dealing with with low quality quality green um, or failures because the contractors do not really know how to do this. Mm, 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 mm. I can see that. So, Mina, do you do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, it's definitely hard to find the people with the right skills to answer your question about um whether it's impacted our businesses it's actually well especially with covid we we're inundated with people who want to um retrofit their homes to make them more energy efficient in in our practice and also their increased interest in um green integration because of their experience of pandemic lockdowns and and wanting and yearning nature and wanting to be connected with the natural world just a kind of wake up call almost yeah yeah especially in the uk now that energy prices have doubled for for households um yeah it completely inundated mikey do you want to I, I would uh, very much, yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's been said. I mean, my my own business, I mean, from the point of view of the pandemic, um, uh, yes, that's been a big, uh, you know, big factor in people's economic, you know, what they got in their pocket. But the, the, the demand, strangely, hasn't declined at all. The, the people are looking for, um, you know, green design for all the reasons Mina just said and, and, and indeed on commercial developments because, their client base and their, their market is also asking, for, you know, is expecting when they can to have more of that as, as standard. Um, and internationally, I think, you know, the bigger issues that are going on beyond it, you know, the climate change thing and adaptation, there's, there's big policy areas now in lots of countries, um, working in Monaco at the moment, for example, where, you know, we're now implementing their strategies that come off the back of this increased awareness of that. So that's ridden over all the other, you know, economic uh, you know, downturn issues that we've had, uh, you know, globally. I see. Okay, well, my last question, um, from me anyway, because I see that you've been doing a great job of answering the uh, questions on, on online. Um, what about the Commonwealth? I mean, we are the Commonwealth Chamber here. Uh, do you feel that the your experience and your professionalism um, has got any sort of higher value added in the Commonwealth because of uh, values and language and and, and, and and common law and all that sort of thing? I mean, a lot of you have worked in projects in Commonwealth countries, whether it's India or Malaysia, wherever it is. Um, again, I don't really mind who goes first on that. Well, obviously, there's a, a language. A language is, is so important, isn't it? And... Uh, you know, we're very fortunate, aren't we, that uh, English is, is, you know, is the language of business and, and uh, the language of the Commonwealth. So I think that's the most important thing. And, you know, we're speaking in English today. A lot of the literature that there is out there is in English now. We did have a problem 20 years ago, funnily enough, in, in that most of the innovation in this area was in the German-speaking world. Um, and now the English speakers and the Commonwealth have caught up with that uh, very nicely. So I would say that's definitely helpful, um, uh, the English speaking world and uh, sharing our experiences. Absolutely. Mina, what do you what, what, what do you think? Is there a Commonwealth uh -huh. advantage? Yes, definitely. In terms of the history, the, the history helps of, of people being connected, feeling like they've had they have some kind of connection from from the past um, and the kind of ambitions that they want to achieve they you know um being inspired by each other it's almost it's almost like a community in a way that definitely helps before before we um so I, I would like to oh, chip Mikey, yes sure Andrew on this one because I think you know it really made me think about this and I, I I think it's it's not a simple answer because people aren't simple and cultures aren't simple and the history is there remember if you don't know any history as you can tell me yeah. the, 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 the having a common language and shared history um is fantastic about because at least you can talk but you disagree or not at least you can communicate um and there's a lot of things that are made a lot easier by that say working in Malaysia or India um, at the same time, you've got negatives of that history that start becoming somewhat barriers, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, some, some people's view of colonial history or, um, for example, when I worked, and this is a great anecdote, which makes the point, when I first worked for Godrej, 
when I walked into their offices, I was presented with a triumvirate of books, a trio of books about the Godridge family history. And I read them on the plane on the way over. And in the one of the books, explained to me something I was ignorant of, as I am ignorant of many things, and, and it was about Swadeshi. And Swadeshi was the whole principle of the, of the, of the Parsis about how, and under Gandhi as well, who was a friend of Godrej, it said that the original Adashi Godrej, they got together, he was the lawyer, and the other guy was the, the developer, and they said, well, look, um, we're going to take on the British, we're going to do better than them and everything. Uh, we cannot do it, and we cannot do it legitimately if we just ape what our former conquerors uh, told us how to do. So if you're going to make soap, go and make it from scratch. Don't even look at pears. So go and do your own thing. And that applied across the thing. And I suddenly realized I was going over as a consultant to okay. people who had an innate culture not to want consultants from other countries because they wanted to do it themselves. And, and you know the principle, if you show somebody in India how to make a suit, they'll make you a Savile Row suit in 10 minutes. In the so, that, that, so what I found is that there's, the communication is easier they're behind us on the curve on this, but they're very interested in what you're saying. They want the input, but then they want to take over and do it themselves. So yeah. there's, there's there, and that's true of Malaysia too, to an extent. So mm. it's very, very interesting. And you know, they are now developing their skills in this area and offering us services. So I suppose this is a natural, you know, um, result of that historical legacy. I don't think it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing. Before um, closing remarks. Um, I, I, I would like to ask our chairman, um, who um, has a lot of views and knowledge on, on this area, whether she would like to make uh, ask the final question. I don't have a lot of views or knowledge, um, but certainly this has been incredibly thought provoking. I guess I have two questions actually, which came to mind. Um, one is based on, I think um, Gary was saying that um, a third of London businesses could be retrof green retrofitted. And I was thinking, goodness, having been through the um, pain of renovating a listed house in um, in London, I just wondered, you know, the sort of clash of all of these various rules and different objectives, that's going to be a very interesting exercise in bureaucracy. How would you see that playing out? So that would be one question. And then I think the other question I was just thinking was, when you think back to some of the development, I think, in the UK, say, post-World War II of those... in you know, huge council estates, which when you objectively look at the houses, they were actually quite large. They were very thought out and uh -huh. they had front gardens, back gardens, streets for children to play. They were very, very pleasant places. And where I grew up, they constituted about 90% of the available housing. And, you know, that was a wonderful project. But when I was visiting the Northeast recently, I looked at very expensive private developments where houses are just crammed together. And yet we're talking about everything being better and more green, seriously. But I suppose, you know, that was a sort of government spending on those council projects, but really at a time when Britain didn't have a lot of money. So I suppose that that's a comment that, you know, I'd be interested for you all to comment on and we can carry on forever. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, guys. Well, um She's the chairman, so you have to comment. Um, but we need another webinar, definitely. Uh, who wants to go first on any of that? I'll kick off, I'll kick Gary, off quickly. Please. So, on heritage buildings, listed buildings, and so on, so on, may well be rules which mean you can't retrofit greening onto a listed building, uh, as you imply. I, However, I have uh, put green roofs on listed buildings. So the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester has a green roof on the portal. Portal uh, was allowed because you can't see it from outside. So uh, you shouldn't assume you can't do anything on a listed building, but you're right. Most of the other greening that we do uh, as retrofit is straightforward. Uh, often it doesn't, doesn't need permission. It's under uh, permitted development. And local authorities nearly always agree to retrofitting of the green features, so that isn't a problem. On your issue of, of uh, density without green space, that is that is a main problem now with housing in the in the UK. Um, we do have policies for green infrastructure, which mean in theory that should be happening, but uh, unfortunately, it does. Um, I would like to see more. Uh, local parks associated with developments, but also I'd like to see more greening on residential buildings as well. I think uh, roof gardens are easier, it would be easy enough to do. 
funnily enough, uh, green, greening um, uh, residential housing is one of the, the frontiers. So, you know, we, we give advice to, to the large scale house builders as a, a pitch tiled roof is something that they is almost sacred to them. Um, so I'm looking forward to the forward to the day start to get proper roof gardens on residential development. Mm. Uh, Mikey, I want you to go next because I want Mina to add the last word. Absolutely. Um, a few years ago, Lord Rogers, God rest his soul, he's, he, he wrote a book called Cities for a Small Planet, and he said the two biggest blights of the urban realm were the car and um, the sprawl. And the sprawl meant everything was inefficient and carbon rich and all the rest of it. And so it was uh, high density city living. And we wrote some papers recently about high density living needs high density greenery. And so you can have both. Interesting enough, where I live in Bath, um, years ago there was planning for that wanted to get higher density to use smaller land footprints and get more units in and um, to have that max with green interestingly Bath met those criteria because not only does it have big townhouses without big gardens but it has very very substantial parks and so you get the high density and the green space so it can be done and why it's going off the rails here in the uk i can't really comment on that but it's it's it, it, it's just a case of understanding the value of everything it can be done and, and you know bath's an example of it being done 300 years ago well thanks and thanks for that mikey and tamina Thank you. Um, I think we've got a really good advantage in terms of green infrastructure and the green infrastructure approach, because when it comes to high density, you can create amazingly high quality, high density, high density um, residential accommodation or offices or whatever building type it might be when you integrate green infrastructure. So it's sort of it ticks all the boxes for the developers in terms of getting the amount of um, accommodation that they want UFA. to do financial sense. So we've got a really great advantage when it comes to our green infrastructure specialism. Well, I'd like to say many thanks to Gina, Mike and Gary. Um, to me, at least, it seems there's obvious potential for drilling down a lot into the details here um, if um, we can persuade you and your colleagues associates and friends we have the material here for quite a few perhaps a special series of um, specialized uh, webinars um, i apologize that because this is a webinar we can't give you a traditional commonwealth chamber souvenir um, but that's probably more eco-friendly uh, and um, We've learned, I think, today, if we didn't already know it, that um, what is good for the world and the planet is also good for business bottom line as well. And there's no contradiction between those two concepts. Um, thanks again. And I would like now to hand over to our chairman, Julia, for um, her final remarks. Andrew, thank you very much. So very briefly, that was a spectacular and very eye-opening conversation, not only about the importance of ecological urbanism and planning, but also how it's done and all the skills and efforts that go into making the blueprints come to life and all the difficulties and contradictions that seem to go with this. I'm very grateful to our inspirational speakers, and I'm sure everybody who's joined us now understands at least some ways for us to do um, more to make our world a greener place. So thank you very much for being with us. Time has flown and thank you again for tuning in. Thank you again, everybody. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Bye.